Well, hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's great to be with you on this Wednesday, March 23rd. And tonight we are talking about an emotional day on Capitol Hill. This is what our justice system is about. It's about judges making determinations in meting out penalties to people who have done terrible things. Supreme Court nominee Ketanji Brown Jackson faces her last day of questioning. Senators ranged from scathing critiques, painting her as soft on child pornography, to words of encouragement that moved her to tears twice. We'll have extended highlights with side notes next. World leaders are mourning the death of Madeleine Albright. She broke the glass ceiling at the State Department under former President Clinton. We will look back at her legacy. In the next two days, President Biden will meet with a lot of world leaders over the war in Ukraine. What will come of these summits to help stop the invasion? We'll have a report from Brussels. And a journalist covering this war had some unique help getting out of Ukraine after being severely injured. You'll see how one organization got him out safely. Day three of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson's Supreme Court confirmation hearings is over. It was another long day of questioning on Capitol Hill. But today, if you watched, you noticed it was much more intense at times than yesterday. For one, some Republican senators excoriated Judge Jackson over her sentencing decisions in child pornography cases. We'll talk about that in a bit. Also, she mentioned one case that she would recuse herself from if she is confirmed and there were more than a few tears. Here are some extended excerpts and side notes from day three. If there is speech that is an incitement to violence, that's one circumstance in which the government might be able to prevent it. But other than that, short of that, um, free speech is supposed to be allowed to happen. And there are, again, various tests and circumstances that um, the court has applied in deciding whether the government can can regulate the content, place and manner of speech. But the general principle is that our democracy is um, thrives because the government is restrained and cannot censor uh, its citizens. As I sentenced people to very lengthy periods of incarceration was you are getting your day in court. You are able to say what you want to say, but you have to sit here and listen to my reading into the record, the victim statements in this case. You have to go away understanding that I am imposing consequences for your decision your decision to engage in criminal behavior. Well, you're at my alma mater, Harvard, uh, is currently being sued for its explicit and, in my view, egregious policy of discriminating against Asian Americans. You're on the board of overseers of Harvard. If you're confirmed, do you intend to recuse from this lawsuit? That is my plan, Senator. Should the Supreme Court overrule a precedent when it is clear to the justices that the precedent was wrongly decided? In addition to whether or not the, pre the prior precedent was egregiously wrong, the court has said, um, the court looks at whether there's been reliance on that prior precedent, whether the precedent is workable or has proven workable over time, whether the cases in the area uh, of the precedent have shifted such that the precedent itself is no longer on firm foundation, and whether there have been either new facts or a new understanding of the facts um, that give rise to a need to revisit the precedent. If you are confirmed, how would you strive to improve the public's confidence in the court 
and its decisions. I, I think that public confidence in the court is very important. It is, um, it's crucial to the rule of law that the public believe in the judicial process um, and therefore choose to accept the rulings of the courts, not just the Supreme Court, but all, all of the courts. It's part of the way our process works. And I think that um, I have taken that to mean in terms of my role as a judge um, that uh, outreach to the public to explain what it is that we do um, to inspire, uh, hopefully, law school students and high school students, um, young lawyers in, in law firms and elsewhere um, to think about careers in the judicial branch or think about careers in law um, as one of the ways that I have attempted to try to uh, shore up uh, public confidence. No one suggests that a 20-week-old fetus can live independently outside the mother's womb, do they? I, I don't know. I mean, you need, the child will need to be fed or sheltered and all the other essentials to sustain human life. Um, so there's no suggestion that after 20 weeks that a child can be, live independently, correct? Senator, I'm, I'm not a biologist. I haven't studied this. I don't know. Why is it important for our democracy's institutions, courts and all others, to reflect the rich diversity of our nation's citizenry? One of the reasons why um, having a diverse judicial branch is important is because it lends and bolsters public confidence in our system. When people see that the judicial branch is comprised of a variety of people who are, have taken the oath to protect the Constitution and who are doing their best to interpret the laws consistent with that oath, it lends confidence. I hope right now in this questions and blistering that you know that at that desk, there are a whole lot of spirits around you with their hands on you. Not only your children, your parents proud, but so are your ancestors. And when that final vote happens and you ascend onto the, onto the highest court in the land, I'm going to rejoice. The greatest country in the world, the United States of America will be better because of you. Thank you. Those are some of the big moments from today's testimony. Joining us now to discuss it further is Bernarda Villalona, a criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor. Ms. Villalona, let me just start with the net effect of today, whether or not Judge Jackson did what she needed to do in these hearings, including laying out her philosophy, the way that she would rule as a justice on the Supreme Court. Today was definitely an emotional day, but Kandaji Brown Jackson, she held her own. It is definitely, you know, that she is more than qualified to sit on the nation's highest court. She has the intellect. She has a judicial temperament. She has the experience. She has her, uh, her, her past speaks for itself. This woman who was poised, classy, patient, doing intense questionings and sometimes I think accusatory questioning, but she was still remain composed and still answer the questions to the best of her knowledge and the best of her ability. There is nothing that happened today that gives me any doubt that this woman is not qualified to sit on the nation's highest court. What did you make of the tone of today's hearings? It felt like today was much more emotional in an array of different ways than day one was, from even the very beginning with kind of the 20 minutes of back and forth between Republicans and Democrats before the questioning really began today with Senator Ossoff's questioning. But today felt like it had a different kind of heat to it. At least it did to me. 
Oh, definitely. I think the senators, many senators, they bought in the heat. Many senators came in with wanting to fight and battle Judge Kentashi Brown Jackson, probably not on a personal level, but probably because they're trying to get their sound bites for upcoming elections. They're trying to get their sound bites for the people that they need to vote for them. They're trying to get their sound bites. For example, look at Ted Cruz after he puts on his show. What's the next thing he does? Oh, let me check my Twitter feed to see how I did. There was so much that was shown today, but what we do know that regardless of what was shown is that Judge Kantaji Brown Jackson, she held her loan and she held her composure. I thank God for Senator Cory Booker because that man really brought us back to the importance of this day and the importance of history in the making. Since you brought up Senator Booker, let me play one moment from his very emotional remarks today where he talked to Judge Jackson about what he feels about her nomination and the larger context within which all of this sits. Watch. And I want to tell you when I look at you, this is why I get emotional. I'm sorry, you're, you're, you're a person that is so much more than your race and gender. You're a Christian, you're a mom, you're, you're, you're an intellect, you love books. But for me, I'm sorry, I, I, it's hard for me not to look at you and not see my mom, not to see my, my cousins, one of them who had to come here and sit behind you. She had to, be, she had to have your back. I see my ancestors and yours. Nobody's going to steal the joy of that woman in the street or the calls that I'm getting or the texts. Nobody's going to steal that joy. You have earned this spot. You are worthy. You are a great American. We understand that after he made those remarks and Chairman Durbin called for a recess that Senator Booker got hugs from other senators from both sides of the aisle. I got to say, when he said, you remind me of my mom, that's when tears mm -hmm. came to my eyes. Because I get it. Like, I, I get the context in which she sits for black people, for black people from South Florida, like myself, that this is about something very cultural that I think Democrats only really kind of honed in on at the very end of this, this question periods, perhaps to try to counteract some of the criticism that Judge Jackson mm -hmm. was receiving from GOP senators. Look, I'm still getting goosebumps, Ed. I mean, I've heard this footage several times already today, and especially yesterday when Cory Booker made that statement last night. I was like, I actually cried. Because when I look at Kentaji Brown Jackson, and she's not much older than I am, and I went to law school in Boston. I went to Boston College Law School. So I can only assume what she went through was far worse than what I went through. But she's not harboring on that. I'm sure she has many stories that she can tell us about Ted Cruz, the one who's a senator now. But she's not harboring on that. She's not harboring on the obstacles that she had to overcome in light of racism in Boston, especially attending Harvard Law School and also Harvard College. She's not harboring on that. So for every obstacle that she has overcome, she is our ancestors' wildest dream. And for many of us, including myself, I am cheering that woman on because she earned her spot to be in front of that Senate. She earned that spot. She is worthy, just how Senator Cory Booker stated. And I am proud of this woman, and I am proud of this moment. So continue to shine and show these people what you are made of. Since you mentioned that she went to Harvard Law, we should finish by playing an exchange or something that she told uh, Senator Alex Badia of California when he mentioned that there were some students in the San Francisco Bay Area who asked what her advice would be to them. And she recounted something that happened to mm -hmm. her when she got to Harvard and a woman whose name she says she does not know who gave her a very simple one-word bit of good advice. Watch. Mm -hmm. I think the first semester I was really homesick. I was really questioning, um, do I belong here? Can I, can I make it in this environment? And I was walking through the yard in the evening and a black woman I did not know was passing me 
on the sidewalk and she looked at me and I guess she knew how I was feeling. And she leaned over as we crossed and said, persevere. I would tell them to persevere. Before I have to let you go, very briefly, do you think there are any particular areas of the law where if she is confirmed to the Supreme Court, where that life experience, where her unique background will play a particular role in the way that the court deals with the issues of the day before we go? Her life experiences are going to play a role in every decision that she makes. She is bringing her diversity of opinion when she set, she's sitting on the Supreme Court. It is because of that diversity of opinion, that diversity, her background, she's bringing all of that to the Supreme Court, and that's exactly what we need. We need our representation on the Supreme Court so our voices can't be heard. But I thank Judge Kentaji Brown-Jackson for showing us at that moment a piece of vulnerability because sometimes we do deal with imposter syndrome but we know that we belong and are worthy. I hear you on that. I, I think it was kind of remarkable how as day two today of the questioning went on, the tone kind of shifted and she kind of opened up a little more to showing that, that side of herself. Bernardo Villaloa, Villa, Villa, Villa Nova, sorry. We appreciate your analysis tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. One of the big topics at these hearings was prosecution of child pornography. Some Republican senators pressed Judge Jackson on her sentencing history in these cases. The accusation amounted to calling her lenient on these convicts. Recent data suggests she might be following a trend. Follow me through these numbers. In 2019, the U.S. Sentencing Commission released a report. It said that in 2005, the average government-recommended sentence for child pornography was 98 months. In 2019, it increased by about 40%. Now remember, these are just guidelines. Judges can sentence at their own discretion, guidelines. In 2005, judges handed out sentences on average of 91 months. That's a bit less than what the guidelines suggested. In 2019, judges opted for an average sentence of 103 months, less than the guidelines by a wider margin. So why is this happening? Well, here's a part of the commission's report Small text, I'll read it to you, quote, as courts and the government contend with the outdated statutory and guideline structure, sentencing disparities among similarly situated non-production child pornography offenders have become increasingly pervasive, sentencing disparities. It goes on to read, quote, charging practices, the resulting guideline ranges, and the sentencing practices of judges have all contributed to some degree to these disparities, unquote. Judge Jackson had been making that point during her questioning. Today, Republican Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina repeatedly interrupted as she tried to answer. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos joins us now to discuss this further. Danny, can you just give me a little law school 101 about this issue with sentencing guidelines? It sounds like part of what Judge Jackson was trying to say is that because the guidelines were written before literally any of today's social networks existed, they're kind of outdated and judges are having to adapt. Yes, the guidelines themselves are problematic. Pre-1987, uh, the guidelines didn't exist and judges could sentence pretty much all over the board. Post-1987, the guidelines were mandatory and that meant that the judges had to sentence within the guidelines range which is a function of an offender's prior history and the gravity of that particular offense. And now you're looking at some of the man mandatory minimum. Now, those are different from sentencing guidelines. Mando mins, as they're called, you'll see that for possessors of child pornography, there is no mandatory minimum sentence. But when you look at the sentencing guideline, often it's the case that that number, I should add that since 2005, the Supreme Court, rendered the uh, sentencing guidelines advisory only. The judge still has to calculate them, but the judge can deviate up or below the guidelines range. Now, the real now if, if to call a judge soft on crime simply because she sentences sometimes below the guidelines is completely uh, disingenuous. It's completely misleading because the real question is, what are other offenders getting for this particular crime? And for that reason, the guidelines themselves instruct judges to look at 
uh, other sentences and to avoid unwarranted disparities in sentencing. So the key here isn't, did this judge sentence below the guidelines? The question is, what were other judges doing in similarly situated uh, cases? And this, the data, and fortunately, the Sentencing Commission for Federal Cases uh, has very robust data. You can download it right now in an Excel spreadsheet. And if you want to crunch the numbers, you can do it yourself. Uh, but right. what it shows is that Judge, uh, Judge, uh, Judge Jackson's guidelines, sentences, below guideline sentences, are within the range of other judges. And that's the key. When it comes to possessors of child pornography, even the Sentencing Commission has concluded that they are out of date and uh, out of touch in some ways. There were some very intense exchanges today between Senator Cruz and Judge Jackson, Senator Graham and Judge Jackson. There was an exchange also between Dick Durbin, who is the chair of the committee, and Republican Senator Lindsey Graham talking about Congress's role in all of this. Here's part of how that exchange went. But part of our job, we have failed in responding to the changing circumstances that face this crime. What has it been, 15 or 16 years? She is currently not an outlier in sentencing. 70% of the federal judges face the same dilemma and wonder why Congress has failed to act and when it will act. This is our fault. Part of, partially it is, Senator. To be honest with you, it is. We have to upgrade these guidelines and decide whether we're going to stick with the Supreme Court decision that they're not mandatory. Danny, I can understand how someone who's not a lawyer, who's not steeped in the law, could say, that's all well and good, but if you create or purvey child pornography, I want you under the jail. If you're convicted, lock them up, throw away the key, throw the book at them, and I hope they never get out from underneath that book. What the hell do they need leniency for? What is the legal rationale behind giving somebody anything other than the maximum possible sentence? Yeah, there's an approach that's just, hey, if it's child pornography, I don't care if it's possession, production, distribution, you should have a mandatory life sentence. And you know, I'm not saying that there's uh, anything fundamentally wrong with that view, but it's just not what the law is. As you saw from our graphic earlier, there are different mandatory minimum sentences which reflect Congress's differing view on different kinds of child pornography. Possessors, uh, those who receive and distribute, and producers. Obviously, producers face the stiffest the stiffest mandatory minimum sentence. So look, the judge herself has said that her job is to stay within her lane. And you stay within your lane when it comes to sentencing by calculating the guidelines, keeping them in mind. And if you deviate from them, you have to show your work, which she does and which all district judges do uh, at lest right. they get overturned on appeal. I should note, by the way, Judge Jackson did in her exchange with Senator Josh Hawley, a Republican from Missouri, did explain the way that the sentencing guidelines affect her work because they were written for the days of like ma the pornography sent through the mail. And because digital technology allows you to send so much so fast, it changes the whole calculus. I know we got to go in a second, but here is the end of her exchange with Senator Hawley. Here's how she put it. Now. With that scale, everybody's at the top immediately just because of the nature of the Internet. So you're not differentiating using that scale anymore, given the way this crime is committed. And so judges are having to decide how are we going to deal with the penalties and do our jobs to impose sentences that are sufficient but not greater than necessary under these circumstances. Danny, briefly, before we got to go, is there any indication that judges will be getting some more help in terms of updated sentencing to kind of meet the needs of today? No, not that I've seen. I mean, now that the sentencing guidelines have been advisory for over 15 years, my complaint about them is that the, the only thing a sentencing guideline range tells you is what the sentencing guideline range is. It's not indicative of data, of actual uh, statistics on sentences. Uh, and you see there that, uh, that the number of set judges who sentence within the guidelines is not 100%. Uh, it is less than 100%, significantly less than 100%. Uh, and so what that tells us is that not only do judges recognize that the guidelines are too harsh, but that statistically the data bears that out as well. NBC legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, we appreciate the explainer, sir. Thank you very much.
Up next, we move from U.S. government to world diplomacy. President Biden is down in Brussels tonight. What can we expect from his efforts to stop the war in Ukraine? Plus, we remember Madeleine Albright, the first female Secretary of State and a very funny lady, as I found out firsthand. We're glad you're with us for now tonight from NBC News. Tonight, the world is remembering a groundbreaking diplomat. Former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright died today. She lived to be 84. A statement from her family describes her as a, quote, tireless champion of democracy and human rights. She traveled a unique path on her way to the U.S. government. Secretary Albright was born in what was Czechoslovakia back in 1937. Her parents were Czech refugees who fled Nazism and communism. She and her family landed in the United States in 1948. During her tenure in government, Secretary Albright held a number of positions. She was a White House counselor on national security in 1992. She served as the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations from 93 to 97. And President Clinton nominated her to be Secretary of State. She held that post from 97 till 2001, the first woman to be America's top diplomat. In 2012, Secretary Albright received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Obama. As the first woman to serve as America's top diplomat, Madeline's courage and toughness helped bring peace to the Balkans and paved the way for progress in some of the most unstable corners of the world. Uh, and as an immigrant herself, uh, the granddaughter of Holocaust victims who fled her native Czechoslovakia as a child, Madeline brought a unique perspective uh, to the job. A statement from President Biden today noted, quote, Madeleine Albright was a force. Hers were the hands that turned the tide of history, unquote. The flags at the White House are flying at half-staff tonight in her honor. Secretary Madeleine Albright is survived by three daughters, two siblings, and six grandchildren. Joining us now is MSNBC political analyst and presidential historian, Jonathan Alter. Jonathan, it's good to see you tonight, and I wonder, as you think about the legacy of Secretary Albright, what your fondest memory of her is. When you think of her, what do you think of? Uh, I think of a, a lion or lioness uh, for democracy and human rights. You know, I was fortunate enough in the last couple of years to be part of a small group uh, uh, mostly former officials and a few journalists who were on a kind of a Zoom on a Zoom call where we discussed the events of the day. And to the end of her life, she was very, very concerned about authoritarianism uh, in the United States as well as in other countries. And you know, based on her own life experience and then her experience in government, which started uh, working on human rights in the Carter administration. She was a, a champion of, of small d democratic values. And so while she, she will be remembered by history as the first woman secretary of state, uh, her tenure as secretary of state and her experience in government uh, really went quite a bit beyond that. You know, She paved the way obviously for Condoleezza Rice and Hillary Clinton, uh, but she also stood up for important values in a very forthright way. And I think she will be remembered as a first-rate public servant. Yeah, you mentioned in terms of her concerns about authoritarianism around the world. I had the honor of speaking to her back in 2019 about that in a conversation for the Aspen Institute. Also, Secretary of State Antony Blinken released a statement tonight. We don't have it on the screen. It just came in, but I'll read you a piece of it to that effect. He, he writes, quote, Having seen America at its best, she pushed relentlessly for us to live up to our role as a moral beacon and defender of freedom. And having experienced the horrors of war firsthand, fleeing Czechoslovakia after the Nazis invaded, then hiding in shelters as German bombs fell on London, she believed that the United States must respond forcefully to dictators and tyrants, unquote. Jonathan, I think that's one of the things that she was particularly vocal about in these last few years of her life, is kind of reminding the rest of the world 
what it looks like when authoritarians come to power and that they're not necessarily these like mustache twirling villains who look like the bad guy. They often come in looking like, you know, visionaries and big thinkers and then, you know, things take a turn. Yeah, she wrote a book in 2018 uh, about fascism and how fascism happens. And it's exactly as you described, Joshua. It's not necessarily by a coup d'etat. You know, Hitler came to power in an election. Legally, he took power. And this is important for people to understand that there's creeping authoritarianism. She was very concerned, according to Bill Clinton today, uh, who spoke to her uh, just a week or so ago, about Ukraine, and she wrote an important piece about Putin uh, that's uh, been uh, republished now in the New York Times. But um, her record on this was extraordinarily good because it was in the 1990s that the Clinton administration pushed for NATO expansion, which was quite controversial, this idea of dramatically expanding NATO. Uh, but imagine if these other former republics in the Soviet Union and Eastern European countries were not in NATO, Putin might have gone in and tried to reassemble the entire uh, former Soviet Union. So, you know, the NATO uh, policies that she, in some cases, initiated are coming in very handy. And as you know, President Biden is in Brussels tonight. Uh, speaking with our NATO uh, allies. So that, that alliance is in considerable measure uh, due to the efforts of uh, Madeleine Albright when she was Secretary of State. Jonathan, I know I gotta let you go in a minute, but what do you think is the legacy of Madeleine Albright in terms of who succeeds her? She was active in a lot of things. You know, she worked with the Washington National Cathedral and Georgetown University. She was a professor, she was a professor there at the time of her passing. I know there will never be another quite like her. And, you know, when I got to, to meet her, we'll, we'll share the, the video of, of my interview with her on our, our social channels. She was just, she was tiny. She was like this big. I felt like I needed to kind of shield her because I was so much bigger than her. But she was funny and feisty and lively yeah. and vivacious, had this wonderfully wicked sense of humor that I was not ready for. <laughs> but it makes me yeah, know right. that there will never be another yeah. like her, but hopefully there will be people in her lineage. What do you see as the next generation of diplomats that will learn the lessons that she tried to teach? Well, there won't be anybody like her because she you know, came of age in the crucible of the 20th century. She witnessed all of this history uh, in Czechoslovakia uh, and was a refugee in the United States. Um, so, uh, there, you know, nobody comes along in exactly the same mold, but she is a tremendous inspiration, especially to younger women diplomats and women who aspire to be diplomats. And much of the diplomatic corps now is made up of women, which is a big change from the way it was in the past. But I also think uh, that younger men, and I would include myself in this, are inspired by her example of standing up for democratic values. Democracy is in crisis in this country. It's hard for us to face this, but we're, you know, we, there's a decent chance that uh, the former president will come back, which was, would be Madeleine Albright's worst nightmare, because she knows that he does not believe in fundamental American values, and that he, Donald Trump, and she would go after him directly, is essentially a dagger pointed at the heart of American democracy. So I think she will be remembered for standing up for these values. Not everybody in government does. A lot of them are right. time servers. She stood up for human rights and democracy, not just when she was in office, but for her entire adult life until the day she died. Jonathan Alter, it, it's almost impossible to encapsulate her life in a few minutes, but we appreciate you helping us remember her well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joshua. Madeleine Albright was vocal about the war in Ukraine. Her final New York Times op-ed, one month ago today, focused on Vladimir Putin. 
Russia is continuing its assault on various cities, including the port city of Mariupol and Ukraine's capital, Kyiv. The push to stop his attack is increasing diplomatically and militarily. Tomorrow, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky will ask NATO for help again. He will speak via video to an emergency NATO summit in Brussels. President Biden's there now. It's one stop on his packed schedule this week. The president will attend the summit, he'll meet with other G7 leaders, and he will attend a summit of the European Council. Mr. Biden will be the first U.S. president to attend an EU summit in person. And all of this happens tomorrow. He and other world leaders plan to announce a new package of sanctions against Russia. Also, we understand that the president could announce permanent U.S. troop increases. These would involve troops deployed in NATO countries now near Ukraine's border. And on Friday, President Biden plans to meet with Poland's President Andrzej Duda. NBC's chief White House correspondent Kristen Welker has more from Brussels. Hey, Kristen. Hi, Joshua. Good evening. President Biden touched down in Brussels this evening, and it comes as his administration officially accused Russia of war crimes. Now, of course, several days ago, President Biden himself accused Vladimir Putin of committing war crimes. This really formalizes that designation. So what does it mean in real terms? Well, it will harness the global momentum and pressure against Vladimir Putin to try to get him yet again to back down in his war against Ukraine. But the reality is that that war crimes investigations are quite thorough, they're quite long, they can last for years. So Vladimir Putin may be punished at some point in time in the future, but it's not clear that he will ever be. Still, officials today said all options are still on the table. Now it comes as President Biden is under immense pressure to try to get something done significantly here at NATO. Tomorrow he will be meeting with 29 other NATO leaders at that emergency summit. We are told that the president and his allies will announce new sanctions against Russia, as well as more military and humanitarian aid. And NBC News has learned that President Biden may also announce increased U.S. troop levels indefinitely to be stationed in NATO countries. But again, it remains to be seen whether President Biden moves forward with that announcement. So there is a lot at stake here because so far Putin has been undeterred in the face of global pressure to try to get him to back down. Will this summit make a difference? That's the real question. Joshua. Thank you, Kristen. That's NBC's chief White House correspondent Kristen Welker reporting from Brussels. Now, as we mentioned, Russian forces have been unrelenting in attacking Mariupol in southern Ukraine. City officials there say at least 2,000 civilians have been killed and 80 percent of the homes there, 80 percent, have been destroyed. Now, residents are looking for safe passage out of town. From our partners at Sky News, Sally Lockwood has the story. The city of Mariupol is almost totally destroyed. In its ashes are at least 100,000 people trapped and trying to stay alive. But it's feared there could be far more than that. The city is surrounded and the bombs drop day and night. Escaping from here on foot seems unfathomable, but we've met one family who did. We watched as we went to the checkpoint. Cars were shot there. There was an old man and woman in the car. They were shot next to each other. And for so many days, they just were in the car. Nobody picked their bodies up. We walked down the street and there was an apocalypse around us. It was scary there. It felt we were in a horror movie. As we walked away from the city, we saw broken tanks, buses and and exploded bombs. Their composure is astounding. Natalia and her son Bogdan have made it to the west of Ukraine with the help of strangers. But when they first escaped Mariupol four days ago, they refused an offer by Russian forces to take them to Russia. There is so much trauma and no trust. They showed us this video of their bombed home. 
The shells started to hit. They flew into the yard, broke down on balcony. A man went out on the balcony to smoke, and the balcony was hit by a shell. He died. Then more. A bomb also flew into the neighbor's house. The house burned down completely. We decided to move from our house to the next one, and when we reached it, strong explosions started. We jumped into the entrance. A bomb flew into our car and exploded. They found themselves sheltering in a basement for almost a month, but with enough food for just a few days. They had money and bank cards, but there was nothing to buy. There were problems with food because everyone thought it would only be for a few days. And then we sat in the basement and realized that we were there for 22 days. It was almost a month. We had a spoonful of porridge, very little. Everyone lost weight. Their courage has carried them so far, but so many of their friends remain trapped in Mariupol. And what that means for them is a terrifying prospect. But for this family, they no longer feel safe in Ukraine. Poland is the next stop, with no plan beyond survival. Sally Lockwood, Sky News, Lviv in western Ukraine. These stories can be so hard to talk about, especially with kids. So we'd like to hear from you. How are you talking about the war in Ukraine with the children in your care? What do you share? When do you shield them from it? And what questions are they asking about all this? Tell us your story. We are at NBC Now Tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. You can reach out directly by voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. That's 888-575-2622. Or email us, now tonight at NBCNews.com. What does it take to get out of Ukraine? One severely injured journalist was rescued with some help. We'll get to know the organization that got him out safely just ahead. Stay close. How do you get someone out of Ukraine, especially if they get injured? There are ways, including for a journalist who got badly hurt in an attack. Fox News correspondent Benjamin Hall has been rescued from Ukraine after that attack left him severely injured. Mr. Hall was covering the war outside Kyiv for Fox News. His vehicle was hit by incoming fire. The attack killed two of his colleagues. According to Fox, Mr. Hall was severely injured and taken to a hospital, but he was still in an active combat zone and needed to get out. An organization called Save Our Allies helped orchestrate a mission to evacuate Mr. Hall and get him to safety, and now he's being treated at a hospital in Germany. Joining us now is Chad Robichaud, a board member and co-founder of Save Our Allies. Mr. Robichaud, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me on. First of all, I don't know if you have any updates on Benjamin Hall. How is he? Is he going to be all right? Well, um, I know he's, uh, he's out of his major surgeries, and, uh, and from what I'm hearing, he's, he's, in, he's in good, good health, uh, minus just very severe injuries, but it sounds like he's going to do just fine. How did this rescue come about? Did you find out about it and contact Fox? Did they contact you? What was the beginning of all this? Yeah, they contacted us. We were we were here. Uh, Save Our Allies has been on the ground since before the invasion. Uh, we had one of our team members uh, doing preparatory work because we knew the was the invasion was coming. Um, and we uh, so we had already been in place doing rescues. Uh, we've had teams that had already been in Kiev. We are pushing medical supplies forward and bringing medical aid forward, helping uh, helping people move from dangerous places like Kiev, where where Benjamin Hall was. Uh, to safer places. So we were already operating and we were just getting ready to launch and to leave for another operation. And we got the call that said he was injured and his teammates were injured at Fox. And uh, we didn't know at that time that Mr. Pierre and and Sasha had been killed. Uh, We just knew that three of them had been injured. And uh, within 15 minutes, we were out of our house on the road uh, to go into Ukraine to get to get him. And, uh, you know, I'm getting a record to represent our team. But there's team members uh, that were with me that their faces, you know, can't be shown because of the work that they do continually around the world, uh, doing precision rescue operations, and uh, and uh, it was just amazing to see how fast we we're able to move, how to get into yeah. that uh, that combat environment and get him out safely. Tell me more about who the we is in Save Our Allies. What kind of people do this work for your organization? 
Well, Sabre Allies is, uh, is, is primarily special operations veterans and, uh, and those who work in intelligence communities uh, with experience in you know, high level special operations uh, work specifically in precision rescue operations, uh, rescuing people from, from combat theaters or dangerous hostile areas. And uh, in August, we, we stood up to go to Afghanistan originally to get my interpreter who served with me in special operations over eight deployments. We're going to get him and his family, his wife and six kids. And we decided to stand up further and serve more people. Uh, we went into HKIA, HKIA Airport in Kabul and we, uh, we launched our team out, went outside the wire in a, in a period of, uh, of 10 days. We ended up rescuing 12,000 people. Uh, in a period of a few months up to now, we've rescued 17,000 people from Afghanistan, Americans, interpreters, yeah. their families, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, vulnerable groups like women and children and Christians that were persecuted there. That sounds like amazingly dangerous work, being able to fly into HKI, as you put it, Hamid Karzai International Airport, which is the main airport in downtown Kabul, and get people out. One of your colleagues, Dr. Richard Jaddick, spoke, spoke a bit about transporting Benjamin Hall on Fox News today. Here's part of what the doctor said. Watch. Ben had some critical uh, injuries uh, that required a lot of attention. The bad situation was or could have been made worse just by getting in the wrong kind of evacuation situation. And so we worked hard at uh, putting together the right scenario to get him out safely. How do you figure out that kind of scenario? I mean, it's one thing for a, a government to be able to coordinate with another government diplomatically, militarily, you know, to get infrastructure, protection from the other government so they know not to attack you as a combatant. Like, how do you do that? Well, I mean, we, this is part of, you know, what you do in special operations when you go into environments and you build relationships and rapport. You, ha you have the forward, forward logistics due to advanced operations to make sure that you have access to certain areas. So that way, when something like this happens, we can respond quickly. And thankfully, we had already uh, had done the preparatory work to have access to be able to get into the area and get out and bring in someone like Dr. Jaddick with us to be able to provide that life-saving care. I I'm convinced that if uh, Dr. Jaddick wasn't able to get to him and, and, and be able to move Mr. Hall out, he would have not have made it. Um, and, you know, a it's few, unfortunate. It's, oh, sorry. I, I'm forgive me for interrupting. We've only got a few, a few seconds I, left. But, but I'm sorry. Before we have to, I have to let you go in just a second. I'm, I'm very sorry for interrupting. But before I have to let you go, yeah. did the Ukrainian government know that you were coming to try to get Benjamin Hall? Uh, we did coordinate with, with portions of the Ukrainian government, the uh, certain individuals in Kiev to know we were coming. Obviously, we want to, we want to make them aware we're coming and, instead of just showing up there. So there was some coordination made uh, and, and it was you know, important to be able to coordinate like that to bring them out. And very briefly, I, I assume Save Our Allies is not a charity. I'm sure there are people who are going to watch this and say, well, there's lots of Ukrainians who need to be rescued. This is a business that you're running. You had a business arrangement with Fox News to extract Benjamin Hall from Ukraine. Is, is that it? No, I mean, we, we are a charity. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we're, we, everybody we rescued in, in, uh, in Afghanistan, the 17,000 people were all from generous donors who helped support us to be able to do that. And, uh, and the same, same here. We, uh, when Fox News called us, we didn't negotiate anything. We just went in there to, to do the right thing and help a fellow human. And, uh, and, you know, in this case, a fellow American. And that's why we're here right now. We're just helping, the, you know, our fellow humans. And we're doing it because of great people around the world have donated to us and, and, and got behind this cause. Gotcha. Chad Robichaud from Save Our Allies. I appreciate you making time, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will get to some of today's other stories in a moment, including that tornado in New Orleans. It struck while we were on air last night. Louisiana's governor declared a state of emergency. So how are residents there doing right now? Plus, one of the world's most powerful evangelists has resigned under a growing array of controversies. What this means for the future of Hillsong Church. Louisiana is under a state of emergency after tornadoes ripped through the New Orleans area. They struck around this time last night. The storms lifted houses off their foundations, left thousands without power, and killed at least one person. All of this comes one day after more than a dozen tornadoes caused extensive damage throughout Texas. CNBC's Perry Russum has more. Walking through the neighborhood, it really is incredible to see how this tornado just jumped 
from house to house where you have some homes like this one across the street still standing and this one here is not where just a few walls are left standing. We spoke with a man who lives in this house. He said they had two different bathrooms to choose from and they chose the one that had the firewall. That is the only bathroom still standing. He says that decision saved their lives. There are blocks of broken homes in Araby. Families stand in the skeletons of where they lived. They pick up whatever the tornado left behind. Looking at it, you got to be realistic. How much are you really going to find? You know, things blow away. Bonnie Norris says she doesn't know where to start. She was hiding in her bathtub when the wind picked up. So you were hiding right there when that tornado hit. And she started praying to God. He has prepared me for this moment, and I will survive. He's, he's groomed me to survive. When she was pulled from the splintered wood, Norris says all she wanted was this heart-shaped frame. It means everything since that's the only picture I have of him now. A picture of her son who died two years ago. How did it feel when you realized that you still have that? Thankful, very thankful. Homes have been ripped from their foundation. Meg Atkinson's house was pierced by debris. What do you even start doing, you know? Do you start cleaning everything up or do we just pack a bag and take a few days off and then come back to it? Flying into New Orleans, you see blue tarps on roofs covering scars from previous storms. We just put a new roof on here for after I <laughs> You know, we need a, another new roof. <laughs> Barbara Richardson says a fender from an RV speared her son's room. Landed on the floor right behind him. Nora says she's going back to work tomorrow. A rush to normalcy with her home gone. Today we're here to get what we can salvage. And then we'll worry about getting rest tonight, and tomorrow we'll start another day. Power crews are working to get the lights turned back on as soon as they possibly can. And we are speaking with some neighbors down here. One woman told us, you know, we're used to cleaning up from hurricanes, but not tornadoes. She said they'd rather deal with a hurricane than a tornado because water damage is so much easier to clean up than what they saw here last night. That's CNBC's Perry Russell reporting. Finally tonight, one of the biggest Christian worship songs of the 21st century is Shout to the Lord. It's been everywhere, even on American Idol. The song comes from an Australian megachurch called Hillsong, and the leader of this incredibly influential church just resigned over complaints of inappropriate behavior. According to Hillsong, Brian Houston acted inappropriately toward two individuals. The church's board said it would conduct an independent review of its processes. Pastor Houston founded the church in Sydney in the 80s, and in the decades since, it has grown exponentially. Today, Hillsong has 131 satellite congregations in 30 countries, reportedly with 150,000 congregants every week. It's faced a number of controversies in recent years. An infidelity scandal brought down its main New York pastor, Carl Lentz. He gained fame after baptizing pop star Justin Bieber. Brian Houston had been on leave since January. Prosecutors in Australia charged him for covering up child sex offenses allegedly committed by his late father. He is pleading not guilty. Thank you so much for making time for us tonight. Tomorrow we will get to your questions about how to explain the war in Ukraine to children. Please do send us your stories of how you discuss this war with the kids in your care and the questions they're asking about all this. We've already gotten at least one voicemail and we would love to get more of your stories. We are at NBC Now tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook and Instagram. Feel free to leave us more voicemails at 888-575-2NBC. 888-575-2622 or email us now tonight at NBCNews.com. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. We appreciate you making time for us every night. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.